Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here, back with another video for you. The winner of this month's poll is the Profession Picking Guide for Classic World of Warcraft, so we're sort of continuing my Beginner Guide series here. I started with races, and then I did classes, so today, professions. Following the scheme with my other videos, I'll try to cater more to the beginners into the classic scene, so just going over the basics here about what each profession is, and maybe some highlights and popular items of each one, their gold making potential, and also strengths for both PvE and PvP. And I'll also throw in my personal picks for each class at the end. The first thing I'll say is that professions as a whole are much more substantial than classic compared to current is the best way that I can put it I guess. It is a bit counterintuitive. More and more recipes have been added over time, so how is it more substantial and classic? Well, we'll get to that for each profession. But in general, point one is that this was still before the age of hyperbalance, where everything must be 100% even with each other. There are items that only certain professions could use, and they'd give you a monstrous edge in both PvE and PvP. And point two is, with gold being so hard to come by in general. In the modern game, you kind of get gold passively just by playing the game, through world quests or table missions, generous vendor prices and so on. But back then, it's a struggle, so these professions are going to be vital. And point three is that some of them are quite grindy and difficult to level, which is just exacerbated by point two, so knowing what you want and what each one gives will save you a lot of time and money down the road, so you're not constantly switching around. We have 12 in total, and that's 9 primary and 3 secondary. Let's start with the primary professions first, specifically gathering, and work our way up from there. First up, we have the skinning profession. As you'd guess, you skin your slain enemies and harvest their precious hide. It's commonly paired with the leatherworking profession, where you can craft various leather and male armor pieces, more on that later, but overall, it's not too different from the current game. I guess that may be a unique quirk, is that they're pretty vital for raid progression actually. You need to skin the broodmother of the Black Dragonflight, Anixia, to harvest her scales, and those are used by leather workers to make a special cloak that allows players to survive the Nefarian fight in the Blackwing Lair. To skin her, you need to have a skill of 315, so with the cap being 300, you have to get special items and enchants to get you there, so there's more to it than just right-clicking enemies. You're gonna want at least one Master Skinner along with your raids, because there are so many skinnable enemies that would otherwise simply waste away. So overall, a very important profession to have. Next up though, we have Mining, which is commonly paired with Blacksmithing and Engineering. Same sort of deal here. It's not hugely different from the current game. You go around and harvest various mining veins spread throughout the world. A minor difference being that each vein has multiple hits, so they're a bit more time consuming to harvest, and combine that with the fact that back then you could actually fail at gathering, and the increased gathering time in general could mean that you'd be clicking on the damn thing for like a minute. Their special resource is Dark Iron, which can be found in the Molten Core Raid, although it's not exclusive to the zone, but you make bars from this, and blacksmiths need those to make some fire resist gear, which is crucial for raid progression. Smelting them requires a bit of work though, as you have to complete a quest to learn the recipe, and you can only smelt them at the Black Forge, which is located deep inside the Black Rock Depths dungeon. There's also the Elementium Ore, which you don't mine, but rather you loot off the technicians in the Blackwing Lair Raid. But to smelt them, you have to be a miner. You learn the recipe from the Elemental Shaper Krixix, who's a hostile NPC found in the same raid, but if you have a priest, you can mind control him and converse with him, and he'll teach you the recipe. Elementium is most notably used for the creation of the Thunder Fury Legendary, which is the best tanking weapon in the game for Classic. So again, another crucial profession to have in your guild. And as for herbalism, for those who feel more at home frolicking through a field of flowers, this is the profession for you. This is typically paired with the alchemy profession, and this is largely unchanged from the current game in terms of functionality. You go around picking flowers, that's pretty much it. A frustrating thing is that just like mining, you can actually fail at picking them up. Don't even ask me how that works. Maybe you're a bit too manly like me, so you have to focus your thoughts on more feminine things to properly pick them up. 
but your big endgame material will be the Black Lotus, which is used for high-end flasks, and an item called the Gurubashi Mojo Madness, which you need for an optional boss in the Zulgur upgrade. I guess one thing to say is that back then, you could only track one resource at a time on your mini-map, either herbs or mining nodes, not both. So for those who want double gathering professions, you may be better off just grabbing skinning as a second, unless you feel like constantly switching between herbs and veins. Next, for the crafting professions, let's just go alphabetically here, starting with alchemy. With this, you of course make a variety of consumables to aid you in your adventures, and you have three types, and that's potions, elixirs, and flasks. Potions are a bit overpowered in Classic, because you can use multiple ones in battle actually. In the current game, you'll notice after using a potion, the cooldown only starts ticking after you've exited combat. It's why pre-potting before pull is so important, but in Classic, the cooldown starts regardless if you're in combat or not. And you have the stuff that you'd expect. Health potions, mana potions, rage potions for you warriors out there, and potions to absorb certain elements. Fire, Nature, and Frost are going to be the biggest ones for PvE. You also have free action potions, which are abbreviated to FAP, which breaks and provides immunity to stuns and snares. Extremely crucial for PvP. You have potions to remove curses, diseases, poisons, potions to increase armor, and it goes on and on. As for the elixirs, these are more long-term effects. This was also before Blizzard distinguished between battle and guardian elixirs, so you could stack multiple offensive and defensive buffs. Typically, if they didn't provide the same stat increase. For example, you can stack an elixir of the mongoose with the winterfall firewater, but you can't stack a greater agility with a lesser agility since they're the same stat. And you also have flasks, which you can only have one active at a time, just like current. We have increased resistances, mana, immunity, but root and pacification, spell damage, and health. These take quite a large amount of materials to make, and they're only craftable at special alchemy labs. In vanilla, only found in the Skolomance dungeon and the Blackwing Lair raid. Yeah, no one thought it prudent to, you know, build a lab that isn't surrounded by monsters. So, some may find that annoying. I personally think it's kind of neat and it adds a bit of flair to the profession. It makes you think twice before blindly popping flasks, and it gives them more value on the auction house since you have to go so out of your way. You also of course have the power of transmutation, so you can play god if you want to. You can transmute essences, air to fire, fire to earth, earth to water, and so on. Mithril bars to true silver, iron to gold, thorium bars to arcanite bars, Arcanite bars, of course, being crucial in the creation of the legendaries Sulphurus the Hand of Regneros and Thunder Fury, as well as other powerful items. The catch is that these transmutations have a two-day cooldown, and they all share with each other. A good side, though, is that it creates a market for just your cooldown. A common practice back then was for someone to supply the alchemist with materials for a transmute and some gold to essentially buy their cooldown. So, it's essentially a lazy man's way of getting gold. All it takes is a click of a button, and a bit of social interaction which I know is scary, but if that fails, you can always just buy materials off the auction house, and sell whatever you transmute for a profit. Overall, it's a pretty powerful profession for raiders. You can just buy all of the stuff on the auction house. They're not soulbound of course, so if you're looking to min-max, it's not 100% essential to have alchemy. It'll just save you a ton of gold in the long run, and you'll even make quite a bit at the same time. Like I said, it's definitely the lazy man's way of making gold. I myself am planning on getting it on a plethora of characters, and keeping stocked up on materials, so every two days, I just cycle through them all, and click a button to collect some gold. Good profession. Next, we have blacksmithing. This is your weapon, and mail, and plate armor profession and it's a pretty common choice for the heavily armored paladins and warriors. In vanilla, as a blacksmith, you have the option in specializing in certain areas. You can either be an armorsmith or a weaponsmith, and if you're a weaponsmith, you can specialize further into either maces, swords, or axes, and for all of this, you have special exclusive recipes. Here are some examples of some weapons you can make as a weaponsmith. More useful for that early endgame, of course. 
feel free to pause if needed here. And here's some axes you can make as an axsmith. The Arcanite Reaper is one of the best, if not the best, early two-handers in the game, and you'll see a lot of axsmiths running around just for that, and it'll definitely be a hot seller in the auction house. Quite expensive to make though, requiring 20 of those Arcanite bars that alchemists make. They can also make the Nightfall Axe, which is highly sought after for its debuff, typically used by off tanks, I believe, to maximize the raid damage. As for Hammersmiths, they don't have anything too crazy really, and that's because the specializations for maces were stuns back then. People wanted axes or swords mainly, because those gave increased crit and extra swings for rogues and warriors, whereas the mace stuns were really only handy for PvP. And here you have your swords. I think the most popular one here is the Sage Blade, but this won't be available until Phase 5, since they originally released quite late in Vanilla's lifespan. Armorsmith has a little more viability past that early endgame gearing, as they have some pretty powerful recipes. The Lionheart Helmet and the Titanic Leggings are two of the more popular ones, as they're incredibly good for DPS plate. However, just like the Sage Blade, keep in mind that not everything is going to be in at launch. They specifically mentioned the Titanic Leggings, in fact. And you also have all of your Dark Iron Plate. Back then, you needed fire resistance for the Regnaros fight in the Molten Core, or if there was a 3 minute mage in PvP or something, and through some quests and rep grinding, you can get plans for the Dark Iron Gear, which has a ton of fire resistance. It's going to be crucial for that early raiding, so you'll be a valuable guild member if you get all the plans. Other key items will be your Sulfuron Hammer, which you need for the Hand of Regnaros. You can also make Sharpening Stones and Weight Stones, which are buffs to your weapons. This is more handy for Alliance players, because the Horde want that Wind Fury. Wind Fury, of course, being a buff that only Shamans have. It puts a buff on your main hand, so you don't want any stones blocking that. And keys are also going to be your best friend. Sometimes you'll find yourself without a rogue in the group, or maybe you have one and they just haven't leveled their lock picking, and in certain dungeons, you'll have these locked doors blocking your path, or locked chests taunting you. These keys can be a lifesaver, and make your group members quite happy. All in all, Blacksmith has some pretty good potential for gold making, but it requires a lot of time farming the materials, and luck getting all of the good patterns. For the high-end stuff, you really have to put some effort in, but if you do it, and the earlier that you do it, the more you'll make. And they have some options for some steady gold too. Remember those sharpening stones and weight stones that I mentioned earlier. Again though, that's going to be more favorable to the Alliance. And you can also make enchanting rods, which enchanters need, so those will always be a good earner as well. But next, we have the Engineer. Those who like messing around with silly gadgets and explosives will find themselves quite at home with this profession, and many would agree that it's quote the best one for min-maxers. We'll get into that in a bit. The Field Repair Bot is present in Classic, and it's just as useful as ever. Even more so, in fact, since there aren't any repair mounts. These were pretty much a requirement for any raiding guild back then. They can also make a selection of guns and ammo, making it an appealing choice for hunters. This gun was dubbed the Super Soaker in my guild for obvious reasons. And here you have your hunter ammo. You'll be needing plenty of this, as you burn through it faster than you'd think. Keep in mind that even if you don't use guns, there exist NPCs in your main city that trade bullets for arrows, making this an appealing choice for even bow wielders out there. They can also make a helmet for underwater breathing, which is more useful in classic due to the shorter breath timer in general. And you also have a selection of trinkets, which is notable since good trinkets are much harder to come by in classic. My favorites were the elemental ones where you could reflect spells. I always kept an ice reflector on hand for those pesky mages, and the fire one is especially useful if there's a 3 minute mage gibbing you. You also have the goblin jumper cables, which can sometimes bring a player back from death. Being a rogue who's quick with the vanish when things went awry, this saved quite a few corpse runs for my party, I'll tell you what. It's also great for a hunter who feigned death. And we also have the stun bombs. As an engineer, you have access to a variety of grenades that deal some AoE damage, and also incapacitate your enemies. There are a bunch of different ones, but as I remember, most people stuck with the iron grenades since they were the most cost efficient. 
There are higher level ones that do more damage, but they cost an arm and a leg to make, so it really depends on how much you're willing to invest there. So these are absolutely crucial for PvP, but they're still pretty good for PvE as well. And you also have the Sephorium charges, which are equivalent to the blacksmith keys. Just a little more brute force. Similar to blacksmith, you have different expertises to choose from. Just two this time, and that's gnomish or goblin. Gnomes focus more on gadgets, such as the mind control cap. This can sometimes mind control a humanoid target, including players, and other times it'll do nothing, or you'll be mind controlled to them. The battle chicken is quite nice, as it occasionally provides an attack speed buff to your group. 5% for 4 minutes, making it another appealing choice for endgame raiding. This is going to be a must for min-maxers and high-end raiding guilds. And you also have the rocket boots, which are a classic. These of course give you a really good speed boost, lasting for 20 seconds. The death rate trinket is another popular choice, requiring a decent cast time, but delivering some big burst damage to your target, even capable of critting. It's more used for PvP, since it's all about that burst. The only downside being that it does drain some of your life. Most of these gadgets do have their downsides, because they can fail in spectacular ways. The boots can give you a fear effect, the mind control cap can reverse like I mentioned, the belt can banish you for 20 seconds, and so on. Another downside is that a lot of this stuff is equipped, meaning that you have to forego your normal equipment and lose some vital stats. But you can also make a teleporter to Gadget Zan as a gnomish engineer. With traveling being so time consuming in Classic, stuff like this is going to be all the more valuable, so this is going to be a must if you decide to go gnome. A benefit of this is that it's pretty close to Silithus, so it's a big time saver when the gates of Ankiraj open up. And as for goblin engineering, as I said, these guys specialize in bombs. They also get some rocket boots, which are arguably worse than the gnomish ones, because if they fail, they break, and you have to craft new ones all over again. There was a bug that you could use to bypass this, but since they said official classic won't be emulating a lot of these exploits, I wouldn't count on this making it to the game. Their helmet is the Rocket Helmet, which is basically a charge and a 30 second disorient and a little stun to yourself. You saw this all the time in the old PvP videos, and it's going to be a lot of people's main reason for going Goblin. Goblin Engineers get the Everlook Teleporter, which brings you all the way to Winter Spring. Not as useful in my opinion than the Gadget Sam one, since there aren't any raids nearby really. It is kind of close to Eshara though, which holds Azurgos. And with Winter Spring being a higher level zone than Tanris, it's also a better spot for high level herbs and mining nodes and whatnot. So maybe a bit faster for farming. But another popular item of theirs is the Goblin Sapper Charge, which deals some damage to yourself, but also to everything around you. 450 to 750 in fact, which is quite a lot, and with a 5 minute cooldown. You may be hollering that this is imbalanced, and that engineers have an obvious edge here, but again, it's just part of the game before everything had to be 100% balanced with each other. Those of you who've been paying close attention may have noticed that while these recipes require certain specializations to learn, most don't require them to use. You can switch specializations in Classic, either by relearning it entirely, or by using a special book that was introduced in patch 1.10. So some people, if they choose, can make these gnome or goblish only trinkets or items, and then switch to the opposite specialization. This is kind of getting out of the scope of the video though. Like I said, I just wanted to cover the basics, and if I keep going, I'll keep you here for like 3 hours, so let's move on. All of this is to say though, engineering has just amazing potential in Classic due to the unregulated nature of the game back then. It's going to be quite a popular choice for both PvE and PvP, and the only downside really is your gold making potential. It isn't hopeless, but you can do a lot better with other professions I feel. Engineering, when I played it back then, was always just a gold sink rather than an earner, because you constantly have to make these bombs as you use them up, and a lot of the items that you make require engineering to use, which hurts the demand. There's not much point in buying engineer stuff if you can just make it yourself. For the most part anyways, there are some exceptions. I think that a majority of people will go gnome, in which case the separate charge will be a good earner, since they can make it themselves. Remember, you can switch from gnome to goblin after you make your gadgets and get the best of both worlds, but not everyone is going to know about that. 
and engineers can also make the best fishing lure in the game, which you need for high level fishing, and they can also make the salt shaker, which is required for leather workers to make one of their crafting materials. So again, another great profession, and I have a lot more to say, but I've spent way too much time on this one already. There are plenty more handy gadgets that I haven't mentioned, but I'll just have a link to them in the description, so you can go through that yourself. This is about the halfway point, so we'll probably call it a video right here. I still have enchanting, leatherworking, tailoring, and all of the secondary professions to cover, along with my personal picks for each class, but we'll continue that in part two, which I'll have linked in the description whenever it's finished. Sorry to cut you off, but I kind of need a break here. This is quite the lengthy subject, and I still want to be fairly thorough, so I'd prefer to have it in two parts. Regardless though, I hope you found the video helpful so far. Like it if you liked it, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.